Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you again to this episode of Through My Eyes with Professor Bola Giacchiemi. As we said uh, last uh, week, we are going to be having a guest joining us uh, this week. But before we introduce our guest, um, I'm sure Prof would want to welcome you all to the show as well. Thank you. Um, it's always a pleasure to have this um, weekly encounter with um, our lively audience. And um, this week, particularly, I'm looking forward to our special guest. I'll leave you to properly introduce her, you know, who will be joining us. Um, and I hope that it will be rare at the age of 18 when she was named a youth advisor on climate change. Uh, at the age of 19, she was elected to serve as the deputy organizing secretary for the Forum of Restoration of Democracy in Kenya. At 21, you served uh, in the East African Legislative Assembly as one of the youngest members of parliament. At 24, she was appointed as the ambassador and deputy permanent representative to Ethiopia and to the African Union. Uh, she holds a diploma in sociology and criminology, a diploma in political science and international relations, a bachelor of business administration, a master of arts. In 2014, she was named as one of the 20 youngest power women in Africa by Forbes. And in 2017, um, she was also named as the top 100 of top Ameri Africans under the age of 40. Ambassador, you are welcome to the show tonight. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for having me. And uh, Prof. Jambo. <laughs> Jambo, Excellency. Jambo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Now, Ambassador, let me start with you tonight. Um, I I've read a bit of your profile. Uh, uh, you are you are young but you got into into politics very early you've moved from uh, one role to another can you tell us was this planned and what is next um should i start a christian or as a different matter as a politician as a christian <laughs> Go ahead. Anyone you want to start with? As a Christian, who am I to say that God does not know who we are? He says, I knew you before you were formed. And and, and the basis of everything that I am and everything is religious and on 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 uh, the fundamental principle of uh, believing in God's word. So that's the first thing. Uh, so that is my take as a Christian. As a diplomat, I would say, um, no, um, it has worked out the way it has, uh, through hard work. As a politician, I can say, I never planned to be a politician. I was born a politician. And I just used what, what was the education, the background, uh, uh, my people, uh, to get to where I am. So I didn't grow up believing that I would be a diplomat or an ambassador or a member of parliament or that I would be sitting on certain tables. Uh, but fate has its way of uh, throwing curveballs. And here I am. All right. Um, before we, we go to the prof, we want to talk about uh, this issue of women in politics in in africa what is your take on on this issue 
my take is that it's actually not an enigma it's, it's um there's no science to it i mean we have the numbers it's as simple as that the thing missing for many african countries is legislation to ensure that the law as the one third at least gender rule for either gender i think uh, rwanda is about to get to uh, having to ensure one third gender rule for men because they have suppressed the 50 percent uh, uh women in office in cabinet in positions in ambassadorial position, parliament and so when you say one third of either gender we should be at a point where we are saying that could be either women so it's not just about women and it's not just about empowerment it's about ensuring there is no position for uh either gender um in kenya i'm not sure but you know we've had governors elected three women governors uh, unfortunately in my uh, marital home i've not seen a woman governor and uh, we have several women deputy governors we have many women uh, elected to, say, uh, to the national assembly uh, in cabinet and that is what we'd like to see uh, from egypt to south africa uh prof uh, how, how, what's your take on on this issue of of uh, women in politics, and how do you respond to the ambassador's views there? Um, it is well, it's quite interesting um, the way she has approached the issue. I think we are fortunate this evening, actually, um, without being condescending. Uh, we are fortunate to have a young lady who has achieved so much. And you recall that on this program, we have had this debate about whether young people in Africa have been given opportunities uh, to play uh, their role in, in, in being engaged. And what struck me about Ambassador Yaya's uh, profile is two things. How she has, you know, she's merged being a parliamentarian, which I assume means she contested the election and won. And appointive posts rising to the very high um uh, post of um, ambassador in the in the diplomatic service and if i'm right uh in about that then obviously the path that she has taken or which fit has thrown across uh to her means that to you know to become engaged as a young person in africa you don't necessarily have to go for elective office you could go via appointive route um being appointed to several critical roles eventually of course while you are accumulating experience eventually you may then rise to the top posts as governors senators and eventually as a president but not necessarily to start with the post of a presidency that's my take from the profile as you were reading it and um I will be I, I, I will be interested in knowing whether she feels fulfilled or not. Ambassador, I, I think that's the question that uh, some of our viewers, before you respond, Ambassador, this is a question that some of our viewers um, had posted before before the show started. They wanted to know that when you were starting out, did you do you feel that some of the challenges that you experienced are still there for youths of this day 
because a lot of youths uh, feel that, like Prof has said, just want to go to the top. They just want to start at the top. What is, um, how do you feel about your experience? Can you explain that to us and explain, like Prof has said, have you been fulfilled by getting to the top or do you still feel a sense of uh, there is still a lot more that I need to do? Um, so, okay, let me start with the questions and I'll get to prof. Uh, so the challenge, challenges experience. Well, I, I started at, at a time when I was, I think probably the only, the youngest uh, woman uh, that was running for political office, uh, which still answers, prof, goes back to prof's uh, point. Um, I was young and female and single and still in school. Uh, I was barely 19 in a familiar territory, but I was in an urban constituency. And so there was a lot of excitement, especially from the media and, and the young people um, in the country. And I remember my first public rally when I was called to speak, and I was in opposition, by the way. And um, not that my parents loved that, I was in opposition then, but we are in government now. Uh, but I think that I, I helped open the road for many more young women who stood in the next election. And I, so there's nothing to stop one uh, from running for office when you're young, or being a cabinet minister, when you're, or being made an ambassador uh, when you're young. But not to say that it was easy. I was physically assaulted uh, during the campaigns. I was bruised. I was hospitalized. My mom had to practically not work to accompany me and be on her knees and in prayer by fire by thunder. She's redeemed, so you know what that means. <laughs> and get my whole uh, family involved. But I also had lots of support from leaders and especially women leaders. My party leadership was extremely uh, supportive or, or, or maybe they were surprised and wanted to see how this was going to uh, turn out. Um, but the women leadership uh, in the country uh, led by our uh, former right honorable prime minister, Ida Odinga was, was very, very key in, in uh, supporting me and we were in different parties by the way. Um, so that was an uh, interesting thing. There was still a lot of feminism, uh, a lot of shock that a young person um, like me uh, would be running for political office, especially in the uh, kind of constituency that I decided I chose to, uh, to run in. But there was also lots of support. So you know, this is something that you decide. You, you decide if you're going to swim, then you jump into the deep end. You don't start by putting one toe in the water to check if it's cold or warm enough for you to immerse yourself in. Uh, so that's on the challenges. Starting at the top, what is the top? Because this advice isn't given to men, but climb and find your way up the ladder. What is the ladder? Who puts up the ladder? Who actually, who is the carpenter that makes the ladder? Uh, you see, that is the myth, and that is the perception that many of us as young women uh, in office want to break, that yes, you can do it. You don't not necessarily have to have resources. You just need to think through it and have your wits around you, your feet firmly planted on the ground, and you can be whatever it is you need to be. So I started, in, in the international arena with the heads of state and government at The Hague. That's how I started my career, my political career, speaking in front of President Bush and many other, actually, I think we had over 70 heads of state and my former president, Moy, and became an advisor on climate change to Kofi Annan and Jan Pronk, who was then the president of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change before coming home to run for parliament the first election I lost for Makadara, 
for the second was the East African Legislative Assembly. And it was a bruising battle. And I went through all manner of insults, battles, negotiations, night lobby. And I can tell you, we would agree one thing at the party headquarters. And by the time I get home, we get a phone call that, listen, there's a, the members of parliament of the party are holding caucus and they have another candidate. And it was so bruising that we actually had to take uh, one side of the government to court, to the East African Court of Justice, ESCJ. It was a very protracted battle uh, that had to get the three, at that point we were only three in the East African community, heads of state, to sit down to discuss how they were going to deal with the East African Legislative Assembly. It was that battle that led to me being appointed as ambassador. Now, one can have the debate, was it to shut me up? Was it to remove me from the political arena and guard me? Because as a government officer, as a civil servant, they, you know, I, I'm, I, I cannot be as vocal as I was when I was a politician. Or was it because the president then, President Mike Kibaki, believed in young people? I prefer to believe in the latter because at one point I had a, a protracted uh, fight with my then foreign minister who thought I was too young to be ambassador to Ethiopia and the African Union with Ethiopia being our largest mission at 24. And he said, youngest female, she's probably going to be a party girl and just, you know, not know what to do. And my president then said, what were you doing when you were 24 years old? And he then said, when I was 24 years old, I was lecturing in Makerere University in Uganda. When I was 27, I was permanent secretary of the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Kenya. So she's 24, she's going to be an ambassador and she will have 27, 29, 30 staff members. So the question you must ask yourself is what you did with your youth. So allow her to be young, but allow her to use her brains to deliver for the country. And, and I think he then set a mood for people to understand that actually young people can be allowed to be young and responsible and in leadership. Uh, Prof asked if I'm fulfilled. You want to say something? Yes, that, that, that's something I was going to ask. Um, but respond to Prof, and then I would ask the question. Um, because listening to you speak there about some of the challenges you faced, what came to my mind was, did you face those challenges because you were um, uh, a woman and single? Or did you face those challenges because that's the terrain of politics when you are going for things like this? Um, I, I, I'd like to to know the answer to that question. But if you respond to Prof's question, if you are fulfilled, and then I'd ask Prof the the follow up question there. Okay, let, let me let me start with yours uh, because it goes back to the challenges, and then I I can I can then end with the fulfilled before you, you you go ahead. Why did I face the challenges? At the time I, I, I stood and I ran, it was uncharted territory. So yes, the fact that um, I was young, female and single played a major role because there was only one lady in Kenya that had been able to do that at that age. She was 24. Her name was Chelegat Mutahi. Uh, Doyen, uh, when it comes to women in, in leadership and politics uh, in Kenya. So the gender issue played a, a huge role. The age was a serious role. Uh, as for my marital uh, status at the time, the former president uh, called a presser and uh, said that uh, maybe I should uh, finish uh, university, uh, get married, have children, and then get into uh, big boys politics so uh yes it was it definitely was an issue 
also the laws were not in place to ensure that there was enough protection for candidates uh both female uh, but because there was no law and you know the law of the jungle um most men had uh, a few days during the elections those days i mean we're talking 20 years ago remember but after the promulgation of the new constitution where we have uh, electoral laws and policy to ensure protection of all candidates that are running and with measurements put in place to ensure that there's no violence um, to ensure that if there's proof of rigging if there is proof of bribery uh, that you know the electoral commission can take that up or the law enforcement will act on it uh, I, I'm not sure I can say that about my <clears throat> other country, but yeah. So, so a lot of things have changed, making it uh, easier uh, for young women, young men, and anybody that is actually interested in running uh, to be able to run in a semi-equal, uh, fair playing field. But then again, I keep going back to this issue: is the law. And it's a law that must be, and it also comes to the fact that we, we must have uh, the three arms of government respected and independent. The judiciary, for example, you do know that in Kenya, although we were not happy with, with what was said, we respected the fact that the judiciary asked us to go back for a repeat election and they nullified the first vote. And they've done that for many constituencies and many players who've come up and have proof of a certain misconduct or mis or un injustice. So today, I don't think we can fairly claim that just because I'm a woman and just because I'm young, I cannot run because I'm scared. No, you can't. You can't do that because we are not going to stand by and watch you being beaten or being bullied or being. Uh, and if you go to court, you get a fair he hearing. So the time change. So what there was then is very different from what there is now. To prof question fulfilled. I don't know if he wants to know if I'm fulfilled as a former member of the East African legislature, as uh, being having been ambassador or, or being DG of a uh, parastatal or CEO, as we call it here, DG as he would call it. Uh, or being fulfilled as a woman or as a mother or as a wife. What, what does fulfillment mean to you, Prof? Oh, no. It's a question for you to answer because you have packed so much into such a young age that um, I'm just fascinated by your profile and the moderator did in a way ask this question in a different way when i think he was asking where you know what next uh i mean obviously uh i mean i'm not going to put words into your mouth um i assume you'd like to be president of kenya um is that the ultimate of throwing it to fate as you said, you are not God, and you know, it is God that uh, determines uh, one's fate. All right, Ambassador, are, are, you, are you planning to run for president sometime? Is that the next thing? I think that probably the, the one person that may know my secret, uh, Prof, is Dr. Wale. Ah. ah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. My, my big um, brother and, and, okay. and a big brother um, of, of leaders in 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 Kenya. Many young mm. young leaders. Uh, but as as you said, that at the end of the day, God determines our our path. Am I ambitious? Extremely. Am I ready for so what is coming ahead? Absolutely. I mean, that is how it is. It is what it is. And what you see 
that is how it is. <laughs> so you, what you, what you <laughs> oh, all right. What, pro, what, pro, what I think you want to say something. To, yes. Um, I think that environment through uh, different experiences. Um, where I, I think that in Nigeria, not enough publicity has been given actually to the achievements of women in the, I would say, public service environment, and not use the word political. Um, we had uh, in 1960, a lady senator long before the United States had a lady senator. We've had a lady or a female chief justice in Nigeria here. I don't know how many countries have had female chief justices. Um, we've had several ministers including a female foreign minister. We've had a female uh, uh, ambassador to the United Nations. Um, so, you know, it, it's just in the electoral mm -hmm. sphere that I will say Nigeria still needs to meet the, um, the Beijing uh, quota for gender uh, participation in politics. I served uh, just about 10 years ago on an electoral reform committee headed by um, a former chief justice, where we sought, we sought to tackle this issue of female engagement in the political um, environment, seeking changes in laws that will permit uh, an opening up of the political space, you know, um, for women. But it's, it's, it's like Nigerian women have done better in the public service appointive posts than in elective posts. Um, unfortunately, our report, the report of the Electoral Reform Committee um, had never been acted upon on block uh, as we would have liked to. Because if that had been done, where we proposed a proportional representation specifically put in place to allow women on every party platform um, for seats that would be reserved you know, for, for women, uh, we might have gone or females might have gone uh, much further in Nigeria than they have done. But in terms of appointive posts, I think the Nigerian female have done creditably in the judiciary and in the uh, civil service sector. Now, Prof, before I go back to Ambassador, I want to ask a question here. Um, as we've, we've highlighted uh, earlier in the program, she started early in terms of um, her career into, into uh, diplomacy. You started at, at um, well, I say you started, but at 33, you were the director general. That obviously wasn't when you started, but you were the director general of uh, Nigerians, Nigeria's uh, foreign policy think tank. Did you have challenges that were similar to what Ambassador has described um, in her challenge, the challenges she faced? And do you think at that time it would have been much more difficult for you if you um, had been female? Because I, I see um, uh, uh, education in terms of political science, education in terms of international relations, common to both of you and what role did that type of education play in your success mm. um 
well, let's not start the narrative in the middle. Um, I was a university lecturer by the age of 29. I had got my doctorate degree at the age of 29 from uh, Oxford. So I started teaching in the university. So in a way I had them um, five years or so under my belt before moving on to becoming Director General, Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. Um, if I had been female, the problem that I had at the Institute would like have had the, you know, I would doubt that. Um, I'm not, we are not a miso, misogynistic uh, society um, in terms of maybe, maybe because um, we've had such a long spell of military rule and for military rule they look for talent and when they find that talent they put him or her in the posts that are available and anybody who tries to create problems for their appointee will have a military regime to deal with and believe me you don't want to mess with a military regime in the way in which you know you will you know mess with um a partisan government so uh i i don't i don't think that um i don't think that if i were female my experiences would have been different and incidentally i ended up employing two female research fellows one of whom ended up becoming the director general of the institute ended up becoming foreign minister and ended up becoming ambassador to the United Nations. So, but, in a bro, way, you could see bro, that. At what, at what point did you be getting married and giving birth? Sorry? Uh, ambassador That's said, true. at what point would you have been getting married and giving birth? Looking at the Nigerian <laughs> culture. No, it's uh, a fact. I mean, it is true. Uh, no, no. These are issues that we must look into no. when we are discussing men and women in in office, right? No, I wanted I wanted to understand your question. Are you asking me as a man, or if I were a woman, at what age would like I've gotten married and start having children? That's what I wanted. To I'm, know. I was following up on what Akin because Akin asked you right yeah. do you think things would have been different had you been a woman at your age with the position and so i'm asking at the point of getting uh, your phd and being in university mm. and and becoming the head of the institution right you know in a community yeah. that is extremely cultural and family oriented like the nigerian uh, community at what point would you have you know found a husband at what point would you have, you know, uh, gotten your children and still be able to hold those positions and do what you can? Because studies show that women succeed, especially in higher education, much later than men, uh, because they put everything off until they're married and have the first, second or third child. Well, that, that, has, not been, that has not been my as, experience. Because at the University of Ibadan, where I started teaching, mm -hmm. there were a lot of female lecturers mm -hmm. who were having children at the same time as teaching uh, in the university. So it didn't, I mean, no, From, it's, do, you think, um, it, do you think Nigeria is an open society? Do you think well, that I, in Nigeria, I just, culturally, I, no, I, no, 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 yeah, One minute. But I just, I just pointed it out to you that in 1960, we had a female senator before the United States had a female senator. 
We've had in a 19- female justice in this country, and the United States has not had a female chief justice. Um, I agree. We, but you see, everything so, you're saying is we have had. And in 1960, the leadership of this continent was of people that were in their 20s, in 1960. And that was the same in Nigeria. But let's look at Nigeria today. Let's look at Kenya today. Let's look at Africa as a whole today. Leaders that were there of your, we still have people that were in the first cabinet that are still making decisions. We have presidents that were there three decades ago that are still being affected. You see, on the issue of cultural differences and religious issues, you see, this is, this is where women in Africa have a problem. And in Nigeria, specifically, one of the things I've seen, you see, the culture dictates that a woman or a younger person behaves in a certain way. And this, perhaps, is, is the reason that your first female senator was there in 1960. And uh, in uh, 2020, we are still trying to figure out uh, how we can have more women in Nigeria. It's the same reason you're saying yeah, we you had a we, We've we had do. two or three chief justices. Yes, and, and I know them. And I know Nigerian terrain and politics very well because I am practically, for all intents and purposes, being married to a Nigerian, a Nigerian, as much as I am Kenyan. Ambassador, I want to ask a question here. I want to ask a question because um, at what point do we say we have enough women uh, in, in the kind of positions that we're talking about here? And where do we draw the line between the kind of pedigree that you had? I know you talked about the, the, you know, the God factor in the matter, but where do we draw the line between um, uh, uh, your pedigree, how you went for it, uh, versus uh, what obtains in other countries, for example? I don't think that Nigeria should discuss pedigree of women. I think you have some of the most educated women. That's why at the United Nations, the second most powerful woman uh, under Guterres is Amina Mohammed. The most educated women in the continent come from Nigeria, from doctors to physicians to scientists. They're there. And Prof himself said that when it comes to public sector, women have had a field day and they're doing extremely well. So the question goes back to why does it not translate to the elective post? And the question, then it goes back to what I said. Do you have laws in place to ensure that there is security and safety? What do women fear most in elections? Violence, rape, slander, dragging of children in the mud, when it comes to political times. And I, I was there during the, the last elections and I was watching and let me tell you, I was, I was traumatized. It was like I was back in 2002 elections in Kenya. And if I was a woman standing for elections in Nigeria, I would think three times before I run. See what has changed in Rwanda, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Namibia, and a lot of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is not the mentality of the people. It is having a working law, having a working police force, having a working judiciary that says, this is the law, follow the law. These are the rules, follow the rules. You are the electoral commission, make sure everybody has a free and access to the ballot without fear, without intimidation. And once that is in place in the continent, I think a lot of things are going to change. And we are going to see younger people, people with disabilities. I mean, in an environment... Uh, uh, Ambassador, sorry to cut you there. Sorry to cut you there, Ambassador. But I I think you raised the point earlier that I want to to touch on here. And this is the fact that um, some of the people you have in government, whether whether Nigeria, whether other African countries... Um, 
as the older the older people are the ones you have in government the younger ones are not there whether male or female yes don't you think that the part of the issue here is not so much the male female issue even though we agree that there is um a gender issue that needs to be addressed but it's it's about uh leadership not wanting to leave particularly in africa yes and i've raised it right but you see that's not just uh in all african countries and that's why i keep going back to legislation right so that you have access for women for young people people with disabilities when it comes to procurement tools the issue is land ownership the issue is procurement access to business access to financing now if everybody has equal access to all these rights then everybody has an equal playing ground but if one gender plays the lesser one and is always uh, prostrating in front of the of, of the older generation then you find that there's a generation that is intimidated there is a gender that will be overlooked if you don't have land you don't have access to natural risk. if you have access to financing and banking and still or unless your husband or father signs uh, the bank loan, or unless you know the bank manager uh, you will not have enough money or seed capital to set up a business that is strong enough for you to be able to do your own to feed so the issue that we have on the continent is equity for all so as i said in kenya we're not looking now at a gender issue per se because the laws are in place and we're still fighting though even as women in kenya we're still fighting uh, to ensure that there is that equity and that fair representation although we've made serious strides uh, on this we're still lagging behind rwanda and uganda and south africa but we will get there by hook or crook or as my church says by fire or thunder uh, <laughs> thank you ambassador uh, um, I, I i want to uh prof do you want to respond to this well um <laughs> Uh, is it just mm -hmm. coincidental, Madam Ambassador, that Uganda and Rwanda, who, that seem to have made uh, you know, the most progress in gender mm -hmm. politics, are actually dictatorships? They are not democratic countries. Is that a coincidence? Do you um, need this? Do you need the strong man rule to actually not only put in place these quotas but also enforce them? I don't know about strong man because what I know is that behind every so-called strong man, there's a stronger woman. Oh. That and I, I tend, to, well, um, as I said, uh, you know, there's, there's, I know somebody with your second name that is my chief advisor, but that's not withstanding. <laughs> oh dear, that that notwithstanding, um, in Uganda and in Rwanda, especially coming from civil war, in Uganda, I can tell you for sure, I know women that have been at the battlefront. They have been there. Uh, through the war fund. So these are not women uh, like my generation from Kenya, where we hear about independent struggle and we hear about multi-partisan. And as much as we, we read about it in history, we do not relate to it directly. Now, in countries like Uganda, where they've had civil strife recently, where they're still fighting in, in uh, northern Uganda, in countries like Rwanda, where those absolute genocide a lot of uh, the mention was wiped out women to forefront women took the lead women ran and managed the lead. and i think that in nigeria women are stronger than the men absolutely uh if the men stopped i think for a while i think there'd be a lot uh, more progress uh and the same is happening in a lot more places on the continent 
and globally. And we cannot remove ourselves from the realities of the day. We cannot pretend that uh, we don't know the population vis-a-vis uh, -vis numbers of women versus uh, men, uh, and especially uh, young women. We cannot pretend that in the corporate sector today, look at the banking is, uh, industry, hospitality, that women are now taking charge. Look at our staple. So if women can do it intellectually and manage uh, all these multinational organizations, why not political leadership? What is the, what is the difference? What is the challenge? In fact, perhaps it's time that, you know, uh, men go back to doing what they should do, you know, provide and go to the banking sector and let women lead uh, countries. Uh, Ambassador, well, uh, I think... I'm sorry, Mr. Moderator. Prof. See, what strikes me um, yes. uh, about what the Ambassador is saying is that, you know, she's genderizing, if there is such a word, what in fact is not peculiar to a gender situation. One, she talks about in Nigeria the way women greet elders. If my father were alive, I would prostrate to greeting. What you think applies to gender applies to everybody not just yes. women that's number one I agree. number two number two um vice uh electoral fraud applies both to male and female politicians yes. in nigeria what we I'm need gonna... what we need it to do in nigeria is to amend the constitution and entrench the Beijing quota. And I said we tried to do it with the Electoral Reform Committee and the report that we, we submitted, but it was never implemented. Amend the constitution, reform the constitution yeah. to address the gender issue, and every other thing will probably fall in place. All right. I think, so. uh, uh, I think uh, one minute. minute. Prof and I are saying the same thing. That's why I keep saying it goes back to legislation. It's not about how we are. It goes back to legislation of rights and equity. And I want it to be very clear. I did not say equality. I said equity. Equity, share and access to resources. But And this can only be done by law and by having strong institutions the executive the legislature the judiciary so i'm agreeing with you prof uh, but as i agree with you i also want to tell you why uh, you know things are different also in this other part of, of, of the world and it's and for me coming to nigeria was it has been an eye opener uh, not because the only women i had seen previously were in nollywood you know that the richest women in this continent are nigerian and they're strong. So watching and seeing the process uh, through my eyes, uh, coming from Eastern Africa, it's, 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 it's a very interesting, um, you know, debacle. Ambassador, let, let's move the, the question uh, in a slightly different direction. Um, we know that the WTO uh, elections, are the, the process is ongoing. Um, there is a Kenyan candidate, there is a Nigerian candidate. Uh, you have one leg in, in Kenya, another one in, in Nigeria. Um, what are your views on, on that? Let me Ambassador. Start by, uh, yes, I'm, I, I, no, I, I do not have one leg in Kenya and one leg in Nigeria on WTO. And I'm, I'm very clear about uh, the person that I think is the most qualified uh, candidate for WTO. Uh, on this, I stand very firmly and very clearly with Ambassador Amina Mohammed. And yes, uh, I think to many, they would think I am biased because I have served with her, I have worked with her, she has been uh, my, a boss and, uh, and a mentor. But I just want to say one thing that um, 
was said by my president. Minister Mohammed understands the WTO, understands its processes, having chaired all its high-level decision-making bodies, for example, the Ministerial Conference, the General Council, Dispute Settlement Body, as well as the Trade Policy Review Body. The length and breadth of our experience with the WTO and the multilateral, multilateral trading system combined with our extensive track record in international relations and our political experience, I believe, paralleled. Now, I also want to say that I absolutely respect uh, Honorable Ngozi. She's exceptional. She's fantastic. Now, we're in a situation where we have two bulls fighting. And you know what they say? When two bulls fight, the grass always suffers. I think it's a common African saying. I would have said it's a Yoruba saying, but we also have it in Swahili. And the yeah. grass in this case is Africa. Now, the thing is, we have the best candidates. We have two candidates that are brilliant, two women from sub-Saharan Africa that are going for this post. We as Kenya have just supported uh, President Akin Adeshina at the ADB. We supported uh, your commissioner uh, for peace and security uh, the last AU elections. I know that Nigeria also has candidates for AU. So this is the point where I think that uh, Kenya and Nigeria being uh, powerhouses in their own right, in their own regions, need to and look at it and agree that on this one, I think that uh, we support the best candidates and we don't need to fight it. And the best candidate for this uh, WTO seat is Amina Mohammed. Kenya and Nigeria have a lot to, to work on and to benefit. And we lose this, we both lose. Let, let, let me know. get Prof's response from this uh, ambassador before we move on. Well, at least she and I will not disagree on the gender uh, of the <laughs> candidates involved, um, since uh, both of them <laughs> are, you know, have the same gender. Um, but on a serious note, I think it's a credit to Africa that we have powerful female candidates. And I just, I, um, I am aware of the danger she's pointed to, that Africa south of the Sahara may lose that post because there are two candidates two eminently qualified candidates fighting for the same post. But, you know, uh, as she will know, this is a risk, you know, that you run um, from time to time and not peculiar to Africa. And I hope that after the elections, uh, you know, whoever wins, Africa will run around they would develop an African agenda, not because she's an African, but because we are developing countries and there is a need for what I would call a developing oriented agenda for the World Trade Organization to ensure that the developed countries don't end up through tariffs dumping their goods in developing countries. So I wish both of them the best. Um, and I'm not going to get into, you know, I'm not going to get into a hot debate about, you know, who is better than who both of them are eminently qualified. I, will, I, go, yes. I go at it. I go at it that Africa is blessed to have candidates like this out there. Absolutely. Uh, and it's about, it's about time that, you know, we, we have a presence uh, on the global scene with our talents. Fantastic. Um, I think we might just have about time for one more question. Uh, pretty much the pattern, the pattern short. So um, I'm not sure we'll be able to do so much justice to it. Um, 
let's pick the the issue of of uh, COVID nineteen as we round up, um, Ambassador. From from your point of view, um, how do you think Africa has responded to to COVID nineteen? Well, I think that uh, the head of the WHO, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros, is African. Uh, from Ethiopia, and I think he's been, uh, as much as he's been cautious, um, a lot of his, ad his advice has been uh, geared towards the African continent. And um, I, I think a lot of the countries have taken heed and taken note of the advice that has been given. Uh, it's good to see that uh, we all know that we need to have PPE, to social distance, and to sanitize. It's also extremely sad to see that uh, we have, some of us have also taken advantage of uh, the COVID situation and we, we can see the scandals that are going on across the continent um, in terms of resources being uh, wasted and abused. But we can also see progress in terms of flattening of the curve. I mean, we've moved from 900 uh, cases to 100 cases a day and uh, as the case in, in many other countries. Um, so it, it seems that we have a population that listens to advice. But I think that we probably need to celebrate the, our front line workers more and realize that health is a priority. And when we're looking at budgeting uh, of our nations, uh, that a healthy nation is a living nation. Uh, we've seen the losses of jobs that have come as a result of lockdown. We have seen what has happened to children because they cannot go to school and they stay at home. We have also seen the incompetency of parents and perhaps our education system because we are unable to keep up with the Zoom classes and homeschooling. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a double-edged sword. It's a blessing, a curse. Um, but I think we we have we are coming out uh, stronger uh, in this. But I do hope that African leaders are going to take the corruption that has been seen visibly from this uh, COVID uh, period seriously, and that perpetrators, those that have taken money of those that are unwell, uh, that needed treatment, uh, doctors not being able to get PPEs properly. Uh, All right. I, I, I think, um, Prof, one last question for you, for our viewers, uh, uh, is this. We've had stories this week of uh, some trials on vaccines that have been suspended because we've had uh, some adverse reactions by um, some of the volunteers. What are your thoughts on that as, as a parting shot for the show tonight, Prof? Well, actually, I think that is good news. It shows that nothing is going to be driven under the carpet. It shows the credibility and integrity of science being the primary focus of those dealing with the vaccine. I am happier today than three days ago when I thought vaccine nationalism was driving the process, that they will come out openly and say, something has gone wrong. We are stopping the exercise. Where we, we, you know, the exercise is being suspended while we look into what has gone wrong. To me, show that at least as far as the Oxford vaccine is concerned, when and if it comes on stream, I will then be able to vouch for the integrity of that vaccine. So it, it, it is good news. It's not something to be despondent about. Fantastic. Ambassador, thank you so much for uh, the joining the conversation this evening. Prof, as usual, thank you for an enlightening session. Um, I wish we could continue this a lot more tonight, but thank you both for this. And to our viewers, 
thank you for joining for those of you on on youtube and the comments there thank you for for that and we'll be back here same time next week thank you